All right, you savvy communicators out there, Anthony Samroth from BeYourselfAndLoveIt.com. Welcome to another live stream on how to make small talk, episode 63 of the Be Yourself and Love It podcast. And today we're going to deal with the dreaded I don't know. Now, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I've heard it said many times. And so it is with the dreaded I don't know. If you get into a situation where someone, you're trying really hard to bring someone out of their shell and all they have to say to your questions is, I don't know. Well, sure, it does take two to tango and two people are responsible for making a conversation happen, but it might be a little bit to do with the kinds of questions that you're asking and the way that you're engaging in the conversation. I always, of course, say, if you want to be an excellent communicator, you take responsibility for your interactions. You take responsibility for making them happen. And this video or YouTube or podcast, if you're listening to it on the stream, is going to help you. Now, a lot of the media on communication skills says, well, if people are just saying, I don't know, you should answer, ask more open-ended questions. And I'm going to tell you why, the, for those of you who don't, know the difference. An open-ended question is one that is very difficult to answer yes or no to. Examples of closed-ended questions are where are you from and someone might just say Paris and then you go how long have you been living here? Three years etc. That would be a closed-ended question because it invites a very limited response. Something using more imagination like what is the most interesting thing about coming from Paris? Then um, or tell me what it's like, what it was like for you growing up. That would be a, those would be open questions. So yes, it's true that uh, people are less likely to give you one word answers if you ans ask closed end questions. In fact, I've prepared a demonstration featuring you awkwardly, hypothetically, at an office party trying to get a conversation out of an associate using closed end questions. How long have you been working here then? Almost three years. Do you like working here then? Yes. Where did you move here from? London. How long ago? Seven years ago. Which do you prefer? I don't know. Would you please excuse me to the bathroom? I feel the desperate need to climb out through the window and run away, never to set foot in this place again. Okay. So. No fun at all, completely predictable. I'm sure it's happened to you. It's happened to me before, including the bit where I um, excuse myself and jump out the bathroom window. So you could see that these closed end questions do make it very very easy for someone to dart out of speaking to you. And more open end questions would have been, how have you been getting on with the boss? Or would you love to, what would you love to be doing in five years from now? Or how does living here compare to living in London, since they said that they moved from London? Now, you can see why these open-ended questions might be more likely to provoke a response out of the other person. That being said, I'm going to break from the crowd, the experts, the other experts on communication skills. I don't think that it's necessarily a good idea to just ask more open questions if you're finding it difficult to get someone something out of someone because imagine you're in a bar or a club and you turn to someone and you say so tell me what you're really passionate about open-ended question the kind of questions that i i am um, suggest when you're getting deep rapport with someone or what's the craziest thing you've ever done you can think of more open-ended questions there's some in my kindle ebook how to make small talk and um, in chat and one of the chapters i give many examples of more imaginative questions than where are you from uh, what do you do and things like that. The thing is, you're more likely to get, I don't know. And the reason for that is the person that you're speaking to is obviously trying to avoid the spotlight if they're being difficult. And what you're trying to do is push them into the spotlight to kind of make it difficult for them not to talk. Um, and if you've been following my video series or my podcast, you'll know that I always recommend that you take responsibility for interactions, at least until such a time 
as the person that you're talking to starts expressing an interest in speaking. And you can usually know when someone's really interested in speaking to you because they'll ask you a question. That's your cue, that's called hook point. Once they've hooked, you can turn the attention onto them and ask more open-ended questions. I want to demonstrate to you, using a counterexample, one that I'm uh, working on, um, for you dealing with the same as this associate in a different way, and then we're going to break down why it worked. This person is still a little bit of hard work, but you can see how the approaches that I suggest work in the long run. So here's your office example before with a new approach. You say, how long have you worked here then, associate? Almost three years. Now you say, I've been with my company for seven years. What I like about it is the management take a positive role in helping us deliver high quality work and I didn't get that at my last company. Is there something that you like about working here? I guess so. The hours are flexible and the pay is better. When did you move? Where did you move here from? London. Ah, London. When I think of London, I think of Big Ben and the Queen and the band Queen. Um, I've never been before, but I would love to visit the UK at some point. Uh, I wonder how it lives up to the stereotypes. Associate. Well, for one thing, there are many different faces to London. So, so some parts of it really do compare to the stereotypes, but in other ways, it's completely different. And that person could just go on talking at that point. So as you can see, the difference between my first example and this example is night and day. I had you do several things differently to help spark off a conversation with your new associate and it seems to be working at last. It might have been a little bit difficult at first. So if we go to the very beginning, um, you ask how long have you been working here then? And the associate says almost three years. So instead of going straight into asking a second question, um, you notice that your first question received a very minimal response because you, you just said almost three years. You didn't expand, you didn't volunteer information. So you, the, we call this social calibration, being aware of what's going on and using it, using what's around you, what feedback you're getting to adjust your response. In other words, being flexible, not being too up in your head and thinking, well, I've got an agenda here to get an answer out of him, so I'm going to keep on asking questions. You're, you're being responsive to your environment. So instead, so once you notice he gives a minimal response, you go, well, he didn't respond very much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to volunteer some information to lead by example. So you ask, So rather than ask them, is there something you like about working here? You answer your own question. You say, I've been with my company for seven years. What I like about it is the management take a positive role in helping us deliver high quality work. And I didn't get that in my last company. Is there something you like about working here. Now, because you've volunteered information, you might actually remember this from one of my other videos, but it does bear repeating because most people don't do it. So I'm going to keep on bashing on on um, to help remind you of the important things. Right, you've, he warms up a little. He says, I guess so. The hours are flexible and the pay is better. Now, then what do you do? Well, that response from that response he said I guess so so you figure well he obviously doesn't like talking about work that much otherwise he'd tell me more so what you do is you just change the subject where did you move here from now again you could volunteer some information and something uh, as well you could say yeah, I've lived here for eight years I moved up with my wife from South Africa or wherever and uh, I was only expecting to be here for a year but eight years on, you know, three kids, um, we kind of settled in. I, I feel like I feel like I belong here. And you can stop and see what that person said. But in this example, you just change the subject. Where did you move here from? Again, you get a one-word answer: London. Hmm. And then then you do something. And um, so when you get a one-word answer, you don't just pry for more details. What you do is you make it easy for him to respond by doing something called vibing, which is you take that subject, which in this case is London, and you just vibe, you just say your associations with that. Ah, uh, uh, hmm, London. 
When I think of London, I think of Big Ben and the Queen <laughs> and the band Queen. I've never been before, but I would love to visit the UK at some point. I wonder how it lives up to the stereotypes. And that's like a shot. That's like a, it's not exactly a question. You go, I wonder how it lives up to the stereotypes, but it implies that someone should tell you. But the thing is, the great thing about a response like this, a vibe like this, is there are so many topics in there that that person can pick up on. You've got, um, they could say something about the tourism in London, since you mentioned Big Ben, or they could go, oh yeah, everyone says that, and groan and lament, and you go, or, or you mentioned the Queen, they could tell you what they think about the the royals, or you mentioned the band Queen, they can talk about music, they can talk about classic rock, they can, um, they can talk about the band Queen, you say you've never been before, they might recommend you to go, they might say, oh, you should visit, that would be great, and then you're in, you know, you can ask them why, what you should see when you go there. And then you say, I wonder how it lives up to the stereotypes. Now, in this instance, in this example, he went for the obvious topic, which is the thing that you said last. But you definitely gave him a wide variety, or her, of things that they could pick up on to make the conversation easier. And they're very likely to, unlikely to say, I don't know, in response to you, volunteering information and vibing on a topic. So they say, well, for one thing, there are many different faces to London. Now, the final thing that you would do, of course, is once that person starts speaking, you shut up. You're not, hmm. You act like they are the most interesting person in the world. I think one of the videos in this series is called Treat People Like They're Fascinating. At that point, when they're, um, when they are ready to talk to you, uh, nod your head, mm, that's interesting, yeah, hmm, how about that? Uh, and you can ask them questions to give more details on anything that they seem that they're interested in. So the new exercise for this is, instead of just asking questions, to think what question you might ask and try volunteer information on that topic rather than wait for the other person to fill in the space. And so if we took it back to our questions before, like what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Like I might just start with an anecdote and say, the craziest thing that I ever did was once uh, I had a band practice in town and afterwards uh, my bandmates and I went for drinks. So we finished about three o'clock and um, about in the afternoon, about three o'clock in the morning, I remember being on the corner outside a restaurant and somewhere along the lines, my friend and I had taken up accents. She was speaking, we were both speaking in American accents. Uh, I was, I was I, I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to do it because so many of the listeners to my podcast are in America, but uh, what I thought passed for a Southern accent. And some guys came down the road and stopped me and they're like, hey, where are you from? And we've been talking in this accent for maybe nine hours, six, six to nine hours. We just somehow, somehow over the course of drinking, moving from bar to bar, we picked up these accents and we hadn't stopped talking in them, but mostly just to one another. We weren't like pretending that we were talking uh, to people, uh, uh, that we were American to people until then. Uh, once they asked me where I was from, I could not resist saying that I was from Texas. And they're like, really interested, really curious. They invited me back to their house for shots. And I had to keep it going all night. So I had to continue in my uh, accent for hours. And at some point during the night, my friend actually phoned me up to make sure that I hadn't got in trouble or they'd found out that it was a ruse and beating me up or something like that. I was just like waxing lyrical to them. I actually had to pick up my phone and answer the phone and speak to my friends still in this ridiculous accent so that I wouldn't give the game away. And uh, when I left, I remember they were like, I'm sure you'll see me, we'll see you again sometime. I'm sure you'll see, we'll see you again. And I was thinking, I really hope not. <laughs> I really, really hope not. So that's one of the craziest things. It's not the craziest thing I've ever done because uh, I had to keep the ruse going. Um, if I told a uh, story like that, you know, I could just say, how about you? Have you ever done anything crazy? Um, or, you know, instead of saying, what are you passionate about? I said, uh, say, say what I'm passionate about. So what I'd really like you to do, if you're watching this, 
uh, is leave a comment on the YouTube video of you practicing saying something rather than rather than asking a question answering your question first and then asking it or suggesting that someone should ask it so if i was to say instead of saying what you're really passionate about you'd say uh, i'm really interested in podcasts like i love i love listening to them in my commute and one of my favorite podcasts is be yourself and love a podcast because it's always full of really interesting information i'm um, interested in on self-development and i'm um, interested in self-development and i like the message of be yourself and love a podcast i would like to think that i could just really really enjoy being authentic and being myself so you can go and google an open-ended question and you can leave your answer in the comments of the video so just one more thing it does sometimes help if you preface your statement or anecdote with uh, sometimes with a turn of phrase like I don't know about you but or I've always thought that one thing I like is when in my opinion the way I see it I was wondering if all of these imply that you would like the other person to give you a response that's it for this week if you enjoy this video please share if you would like some help improving your social skills you can email me at anthony at beyourselfandloveit.com and until next time be yourself but don't just be yourself be yourself and love it.